Hi, this is Natalie Lander, voice of Kinsey, Tara Branford, Stargirl, and many others. You are listening to a W2Mnet podcast. You can visit W2Mnet.com for other podcasts about entertainment, video games, sports, and wrestling. You are listening to Video Games to the Max. Hello and welcome to another episode of Video Games to the Max. This is episode 209, and we are here with you for another week of talking game news and whatever else. I'm sure if you have us subscribed, you have noticed a lot of alternative things in your feed there with us doing our Games of the Decade stuff, so we're... Almost at the doing the actual top 100. We got to go through one little preliminary thing left, and then we'll we'll start uh, ranking those. Of course, here with me is Mr. Mark Morrison. Howdy. And of course, we are the official games podcast at WTNet.com, and also uh, in partnership with Last Word on Life over there. So thank you to them for having us on and. This is your first time. Well, thank you. If this is your, I don't know how many a time, then thank you for that too. And of course, we're available wherever there are podcasts, pretty much, you know. So hopefully you're listening on your favorite provider. If not, check it because they're probably there. And you can always write a review wherever you like to listen as well. That helps out a lot. So go do that when you can. So pretty much uh, we're still kind of, and Mark is technically playing. A rev- or has a game for review that's actually a game from last year uh, and I'm still waiting to hear on a few if uh, I'm going to be reviewing anything to, to start the year but have you been playing anything uh, that, that's out there? Yeah, the three things I've been playing uh, I got, I finally installed Hitman 2, I was able to clear off enough hard drive space for that <laughs> That's like 120 gigabytes or 110 or something. It's massive. Uh, it's more Hitman. <laughs> Seems fun. Like you know, I'm just not. I don't think I'm just good at those games. Like I'm just too impatient. I mean, it does require a lot of planning and thinking and being there at the right, right moment. Well, the thing I don't like about him is like, okay, trying to get all the cool weapons and stuff, you have to like get masteries in the levels. You say actually you have to like do well or at the start or you know just keep replaying levels and over and over. It's gonna get this cool shit now. Then I can actually go through these levels pretty easily. <laughs> oh yeah, certainly. Uh I mean it would it'd be nice if you can get it like that quick, but yeah, it makes you go through a progression and yeah. I know a lot of people that just absolutely love that game and part of the reason why uh, I think Goose Game got a lot of publicity was that it's very similar to Hitman uh, in yeah. a way. So, uh, What else? Uh, I got, I mean, this is like last month or so, I got a uh, SD to SNES flash cart for Super Nintendo. So you put an SD card in it and so, you know, you put every game on there essentially. But, well, any, anything you're just well, playing, playing off that? Uh, there's a way, I guess the SNES has something called an MSU-1 chip, or hyphen 1 chip, that's like a sound chip, and it can like do really good audio, but no game ever used it, because they were they were limited by cartridge size at the time. <laughs> but, you know, with this thing, basically it can replace in-game audio for like games with like CD quality music. <laughs> so, wow, nice. I have a cop. I have a few copies of Zelda. One is well, they all, you can also add in anime intros or anime video sequences, which is nuts on a Super Nintendo. <laughs> Imagine I, if you had that at the time. How crazy! Yeah, that. it would have. It blown, yeah, it would have blown your mind because I she, like I showed it to a friend of mine and she was watching like the Zelda Link to the Past intro and she was like, "Why does it look so blocky?" And I'm like, "Because the Zel- the Super Nintendo ran on like a 320 resolution, <laughs> like." What do you expect? <laughs> like, it's not going to be 
pristine quality anime. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's going to be the anime of what the graphics would have looked at at the time. <laughs> yeah. But I have two copies of Zelda. One has like a very good orchestral like soundtrack. And the other one has the uh, Cadence of Hyrule soundtrack. Which is wow, pretty neat. Nice. <laughs> yeah, and there's like a few others. Like one one there's like a link to the Link Between Worlds soundtrack one. I think there's like a metal soundtrack. So Yeah, that's fun. I mean also like it's funny because, you know, a normal Super Nintendo game is like two megabytes, if that, half the time. These games are like eight hundred megabytes. <laughs> Because the the sound files are all basically like wave files, so they're all like massive. Like each song is like thirty megabytes. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, that'll uh, that'll bump up your store your space pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, and the last game that you alluded to earlier, I've been playing uh, some Dark Tide of Genesis. Uh, yeah, it's fun. It's it, did you, did you ever play those uh, Laura Croft Guardian of Light games? Or those yeah, what, Guardian of Light is pretty good. Were? Yeah. <laughs> It's basically that, only oh, with wow. like a, a lot more combat, um, and not as much puzzle solving necessarily, at least not yet. Uh, but yeah, he plays War and Strife. They introduced the, the Last Horseman, finally. Uh, and so, like, War is a little more, like, melee-focused, and Strife has guns. They don't, they don't quite explain why, how War lost his gun, maybe, like, in one of the other games or something, but... Uh, yeah, it's isometric, or you know, it's top down. It's it ha- it does have co op. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. I think. Did they say why they just released this instead of saying, "Okay, here's Dark Siders Four with Strife"? Uh, I well, this, I mean, this is somewhat of a cost cutting game, I would say, or it's done a little on the cheap. Like they don't have like they actually, to their credit, they actually have all the voice actors from like the the for other games, like you know, War. They still have that voice actor, but like the, the cutscenes are like comic book panels, or like you know, they're not like animated, or like they're not like the high, you know, high uh, value or high production value that they used to have necessarily. Like this is a smaller in scope game, so it makes more sense that they did it. I think they are working on Dark Siders Four though. It's supposed to be like an all like all four of them together or something. Oh, okay, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, I think that's what everybody's kind of wanted. They wanted that game where you can finally just play as all the dark, all the the horses, horsemen of the apocalypse, or whatever. Well, it's funny because uh, what's this? Uh, like the way this game starts is really weird because it's just like War and Strife are partners, like working for the whatever council there is. But I didn't play three, so I don't know how that one ended. But Darksiders 1 and 2 ended on a pretty definitive note. Like, it was like, all the horsemen are crashing into the world, and, you know, it's like, oh, all, you know, all they're all finally back together. So it's like, the way this game starts is this, these two together, I'm like, wait, huh? <laughs> like, I guess I made it, I should have played 3 to find out what the hell the story, what happened in that story. <laughs> yeah, I think also it's, I mean, it's not just that, I think it's, they had to end them in definitive ways because they really didn't know if they were going to keep making that next game. Yeah. So, but yeah, it, it's pretty fun. Yeah, I I like it. I've just, I mean, it's supposed to, it, the game's about a month old actually, and yeah, they didn't get me a code till. It's well, it still late, technically so. hasn't hit consoles till next month. So, yeah, I mean that'll be the game. But probably me and Yens play together because it you know it does have really good co op, or you know it would I would imagine. Because, uh, you know, it's like, it's like Smash TV or something. <laughs> Any word on crossplay or No, God, no. Oh. <laughs> no, that'll never happen. <laughs> Probably not. But just figured so you wouldn't have to buy an extra console copy when you already had the PC. Yeah. The weird, the weird thing is people keep comparing it to Diablo. And it's like this, I mean, the perspective is the same, but it's not like Diablo at all. Because that was a loot-based game. Like, this game has no loot. <laughs> like, so it's like... The comparison here isn't quite apt. Like that's why I keep calling it comparing it to that Laura Croft game because it's a lot more like that game than like a Diablo. It's not like you're picking up like, oh, I got the shoulders of the bear. I got plus two strength now or something like that. Like that, that's not in here at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, at least they kept the, probably what's most people's favorite part of the game is the battling. So yeah, I mean, it's 
it's top down, and it, I mean, it is more simplified, but it is still that game, <laughs> or still Dark Siders, pretty much. Yeah. So that do it for you on. Yeah, on I got Monster Hunter Ice Planet or whatever the fuck it's called, but I haven't played it yet, and it'll take me some time because I've uninstall Hitman Two to get it <laughs> to free up enough space to play it. <laughs> well, the good thing is you already played Monster Hunter World on there, so yeah, you just keep going oh. from there. Yeah, hopefully I can, uh, yeah, just go at it, I guess. <laughs> I didn't, use like, that, max up use my... Use that cheat engine. Yeah, well, I didn't max up my character, so I may have to... I don't know if it starts you with a new character, or if it scales, or what, but we'll see how that goes. <laughs> I'd imagine it being expansion unless you start with your old character if you want. Yeah, but, I mean, I imagine, like, oh, you not, not have to be, like, level 30 or something, or whatever. I, I'm not even sure if that game had levels, like, it, but... You know, you have to have your gear at a certain level to right. even start the, you know, something that's going to give it to you, or... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, I've been playing a pair of One Piece games, basically. Uh, so, I play a little bit of One Piece Pirate Warriors 3. I got that on the sale that were, they were doing during Christmas time. And they have... Right now, the Switch has a similar sale going on with a lot of those same games are on sale, so I picked up uh, Unlimited World Red. And uh, Pirate Wars 3 is a Musu game. Uh, if you played one of those, you know how that works. Uh, it's fun. You know, having the One Piece characters is fun because, you know, they all have powers, and it's actually pretty uh, intuitive. I mean, it's... And, like, I, I've only been able to play with Luffy so far, but he's pretty fast, and it's fun just knocking off dudes with all his his gatling and rocket and all that stuff he does with his with his rubber arms so uh unlimited world red is a lot more of a, it's like a more story based mission mission type based like the world seeker game that came out last year uh, except this is a bit tighter like it's it has chapters and i've only been through i think like the chapter two and, uh, I mean, it's, it's like, it has full, it has, it's funny cause it like has a cutscene and then it, it like stops and does a cutscene where nobody's mouth moves and they just talk while the characters are kind of just standing still <laughs> and it's, uh, kind of funny in, in the way it does it. But yeah, I mean, you got the full voice actors, you got the, you know, the art is what you'd expect from one piece, but I just like the way the... The game moves and it runs pretty well on Switch, so. Yeah, I mean it's yeah. an old PS3 game, so I imagine yeah it would run pretty well, and that was a fun game back in the day, so. Yeah, so uh, still uh, fun today, and if you're a One Piece fan that's that's looking for some games, both of those are worth picking up, especially with Pirate Wars Four uh, coming out this year. I'd so. probably get One Piece some little world run on PC just for a cheat engine because like there are some like really weird. Have you gotten to the town yet, or have you like explored the town much? Yeah, I like opened the tavern and went in and got like you know I fished some, so then I got into the the place where you can actually go and have them turn it into a meal for you. Or yeah, like you need like a lot of ingredients to like do mm-hmm. stuff, or you know. So that's what I'd probably just use it for because I don't want to go hunting around for one ingredient for twenty hours or something like that. <laughs> right. Yeah, and the other major thing I've been playing, I'll talk about when we talk about the Pokemon stuff. So, but uh, first off, you're, you're playing a what? Digimon game. <laughs> no, uh, even though Digimon <laughs> does have a game coming out, the Digimon Survive thing comes out this year sometime. So, uh, Xbox Series X drawing some controversy and some people getting mad. You'll hear me say this again when we talk about the Pokemon stuff. Pokemon or Xbox Series X won't have exclusives for basically almost two years because Microsoft is thinking about the people that have the older systems and making all of those exclusives cross-gen, where they will work not only with your PC, but also your Xbox One X and your regular Xbox One. So even though it doesn't incentivize you to... And also the Xbox One S. I I forget sometimes that that's also there. And so, 
you know, even though it doesn't incentivize you to get the Series X right away, considering all the things that tend to happen at launch and how a lot of sometimes features aren't there for your console or your online system and doesn't have all the stuff, all the quality of life stuff that tends to get put in there later, I think this isn't the worst thing. I mean, you know many people... There are a lot of people that trade in their consoles, right, to get the next one. But there are also people like me and many others that they don't do that. They keep their old console. So if you have multiple rooms where you like to play games, you can just take your old console. And if you buy a disc, it should work in both systems. So all you have to do is take your disc with you and, and it'll work. And I mean, I don't know. I think it's a good thing uh, considering all the stuff they've had to go through. Not everybody is going to just decide that they want to get an Xbox Series X. They might wait for a little bit. And I think that's good for fans that see Halo Infinite come out and go, oh, there's this really cheap version of an Xbox I can buy. Or I can even play it on the X Cloud on my phone. Or I can play it on PC that I already have or whatever. And and you don't have to jump out and, and buy the console. I mean, do you think this is uh, good or bad? For Microsoft. Uh, I mean, I see why they're doing it. I think there are two two problems. First of all, if they're doing this, it doesn't give a lot of people incentive to buy the new console. <laughs> yeah, but I don't think they're really focused on that, or they wouldn't be making xCloud, and they wouldn't have Game Pass, and they wouldn't have Game Pass work on PC, and, you know, like, it seems like I mean, they're... At, at that point, why why be a hardware manufacturer then? Why not just you know say fuck it and become like Sega and just make you know become a software developer? Well, because there's incentives to having that work, right? Like you can do almost basically like a remote play with your Xbox. You can you can start on your Xbox, save, and then if you need to go somewhere but you can't take your Xbox with you, you can keep playing on your phone. Yeah, like, but you're, you're missing the point of like. If they don't care about selling this thing, then why make it at all? I mean, they could just be, you know, they could just keep cranking out Halo games and Forza games, and like I said, just become like Sega. Like Sega doesn't make hardware anymore. Like, <laughs> because there's always that that type of gamer that has the 4K TV that wants the big time, you know, graphics that goes with it, and Microsoft has no problem providing that for you. And I think that's not if hey if they want to spend their money on that and then nobody else goes out and buys it, then maybe perhaps next time they think about it, you know. But I think letting Sony be out there as the only console maker, and you're trying to sell people on hey we've got Halo that you can play on your phone or on your PC. I don't know. It's not going to sit well. I think with with people. The the other thing, and this this is I think the re, the real reason why, is because they don't have any exclusives. <laughs> they don't have any ready for only ready for Xbox One, whatever the fuck this thing is called, game. You know, so yeah, of course all their games are gonna be cross generational because like it's not like Hellblade Two is gonna come out like on release, you know, the Xbox release date or anything, or you know most of these games at least like one or two years out. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, they they could have made Forza only Xbox One X if they wanted to, or not One X, it's Series X. Yeah. You know, but does that really sell? That doesn't really sell consoles. Right. You know, and they could have done it with Halo. That does sell a console, but they chose I not mean, to. It did. Uh, Halo's really taken a beating over the past few years, though. Like as far, like it's really lost a lot of its luster. I think. Well, four is still four was still good. I think five they just tried to take it into a totally different direction that nobody wanted. And I mean, now four played they, four played fine, but I mean, I still see I see a lot of complaints about four as well. Like it's yeah. just you know it's just kind of continuing this story that kind of ended pretty definitively with like Halo three at least. And it's like, well, I guess we got to keep making these. <laughs> I mean, I kind of feel like. Gears of War, Gears of War four and five, at least you know went in the future a little, or you know you're not playing as Marcus anymore, at least thank God. But you know it's kind of the same thing, honestly. Yeah, similar. It, they both 
seem to have that problem. Gears was able to progress beyond that, and I think I think with Halo they couldn't. They tried to turn Master Chief into something that people just didn't want. Didn't want, and now they have had to go back to the drawing board with that. And perhaps Halo Infinite will solve some of those issues. I don't know that people had, but yeah, yeah. what well, we'll have to see. I don't know. I just I think the people that are complaining about this really hard are just not seeing. If you take into account everything that Microsoft has been doing for these few years where they've been the loser, I think it's. I think they have to take baby steps. They can't just go in expecting that. Okay, Sony's going to get. We're going to beat Sony after every after Sony just has a huge ass lead on us and Nintendo and everybody. I mean, I don't know that Xbox with, with all those studios that they bought, none of those make me go, Oh, that's the Sony killer. Those are all like nice studios. Those are all, they can make good games in their genres that I think people would like. I don't know, man. You know, compulsion, when compulsion games makes, we happy few too. You will eat those words. <laughs> that'll that'll be the uh, Sony killer right there. <laughs> oh God! Wait, I really hope that they're making something <clears throat> that's not. We have a few too. Uh, but we hey, um, I mean, but also cross generational games have been on the last generation and the one before that. So it's not like a huge deal, like necessarily. <laughs> Yeah, and again, I think it also goes to they have tried really hard to sit there and and make it to where you can play your original Xbox games, your Xbox 360 games, all that. So why wouldn't you do this going forward and make it to where... For right now, you're going to be able to play the Series S games eventually. Yeah. When they do have all these games that they feel are... It's been long enough, a year and a half, two years, to where... Okay, you should have had a Series X by now, or a Series S, or whatever other SKU they come up with. There's no what, more going that name, far back. What a good naming convention they have. <laughs> I mean, do, do you think... I mean, I think most of the people's problem with it is that it's going to affect the look of those games on the Series X. Do you... That's one problem. And the, yeah. the other problem will, will also be, like, why would you buy the Series X at launch then? I mean, that's what I was saying earlier. Like, yeah. if it's not going to... If it's not, You know, if Halo 6 or 7, or whatever they're going to call it next, isn't going to be, like, an exclusive game, it's like, well, then I'll just wait till that comes out, you know, three or four years down the line. <laughs> Then I'll finally buy the system. Yeah, I mean, with these consoles being more like PCs now, I think the descaling isn't as big a deal as it used to be. Yeah. I think you can make those games look really, really good on the Series X. It'll look amazing, and then it might look like crap when you play it on your Xbox One, or it might run like crap, like we had problems with the control. You know, so I think that's going to be a bigger issue. Are these games going to run well on every version of the system? Or are you going to have more things like Control and some other games that have come out where your PS4 runs like a freaking jet because it can't run God of War well? Or, you know, Xbox with, you know, put place game name here. So that's what I worry about more is as you keep building bigger and bigger games and you're trying to make them work on these older systems, how well are they going to run it? How many times are you going to have to deal with a patch? And and if you actually bought it and aren't playing it on Game Pass, how much of a problem is that going to be too? Yeah. So, moving on from that, Nintendo is also not short on rumors because, hey, it's a new year and we've got to continue to peddle this thing about there being a Switch Pro. And so, Taiwanese website Digitimes is reporting that a new Swiss model is going to enter mass production 
between Q1 2020 and mid 2020 for a mid 2020 release. And once again, this has people thinking that this is going to be a Switch Pro with, you know, I guess more battery life, better graphics, 4K support, which I don't see that happening. Uh, not for. It, well, I can see it happening because if, well, if it's a better. I mean, the reason I see it happening is it could have a better CPU in it for one, but the bigger thing would probably be like a powered dock or like a more, much more powerful dock. Like if I can be 4K handheld, but it could be 4K, you know, plugged in. Right, but how much are you going to charge for this too, I think? Probably $400. Yeah. So uh, do you think we see it this year? Uh, maybe, because I mean, it, it'll be the, I mean, if, I think if they do it, it'll probably be the summer because they want to get ahead of, you know, the uh, Sony and, and Microsoft stuff. My my only concern, my my big thing, and I would I would actually happily trade in my Switch right now if it had a better analog stick or better, like, Joy-Cons. Because my Joy-Cons are, like, I had one already repaired, it's broken again. And it's like, what, what the hell? Like, <laughs> I didn't have this problem on an N64. Like, those fuckers lasted forever. So, you know... What it can only last four months now, like that—that's not great. <laughs> yeah, I think definitely they're going to have to. If they're doing this, you have to solve the Joy-Con drift thing, and you—you you do need to have better controllers uh, because that's a problem for people. I think your screen, perhaps, think about including a screen protector with it. If anything, if you're not going to improve the screen. Are you going to make it even bigger? Are you going to are you going to make it the same size as the Switch, just run better? I think there's a lot of quality of life things that they could certainly include in there that make it worth it. I don't know. I just don't see them doing that this year when they have a lot of games that people are... I mean, we don't know what it is. At past March, we don't really know what their game lineup is, but they do have some games in reserve there that they could announce for this year and and I think that would take people's minds off the whole well we need a Switch Pro it needs to come out because Nintendo's not Nintendo could do one of two things they could just absolutely decide we don't give two craps about what's happening with Sony and Microsoft we're just going to release this thing in November just like everybody else and you guys buy it if you want to people are still buying the regular Switch so you know who cares or they could not release it at all and say, well, we're going to take our time because either way we can't compete with these two behemoths and we're going to keep doing our thing over here and we'll release this if we're, if there is going to be one in 2021 or later. You know, because... Yeah, because... Well, did you see I, did you see the Kotaku uh, like Top 25 handheld list? I haven't seen it. I saw the, that it was on you know the main page or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like, 19 of the 25 handhelds were Nintendo ones. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean... Yeah, so, I mean, like, they are revisionist as hell. So, I mean, believe me, this thing's coming eventually. <laughs> yeah, and they had the 3DS XL, which is what I have. And that was basically just... It was supposed they, to be this way more powerful thing that only had two games basically yeah. made for it. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's... It's one of those where I expect them to do it, but do they need to rush out and do it? I don't know. Because the Switch Lite made sense. I don't think you need to rush out and put this this Pro well, they didn't, out there. I mean, they didn't even fix that. that. That still has the same analog problem as the regular Switch. Well, no, it certainly it does. I'm just saying that they made it, and it made sense. Okay, a lot of people play the Switch handheld. Let's put a handheld-only Switch out there. You know, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I just think I'm going through this list. I think Vita was the only one that made it in the 20s that wasn't Nintendo. <laughs> so, or no, there's the PSP, right? I forgot about that thing. So yeah, I think we'll see it. Personally, I think they're gonna wait this year. I think maybe it gets announced or whatever, but they're not rushing to make sure they get it out. 
I mean, there's already been one. It was minor, but they already had one Switch revision as it is. So yeah, the one with the better, the better battery. Yeah. So, which is a lot of people's come aside from the Joy-Con thing. That was a lot of people's complaints was the battery life. So I mean, I actually have a problem with battery life. It lasts like two or three hours, at least mm-hmm. for me. Uh, but I mean, yeah, if it lasts eight or nine, it'd be cool. But I don't necessarily need it. <laughs> well, that's what the better battery one is, right? It lasts like four and a half to nine hours or something. Well, yeah, but I think it all depends on the game. Like if you're, you know, if you're playing, uh, you know, six to nine, I think the Swiss light was like, what, an hour more or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. But it all depends on the game. Like if it's something super graphical intensive or CPU intensive, then it's going to obviously be shorter. But if I'm playing puzzle quest last, you know, on my switch, it lasts forever. (laughs) Right. Right. Exactly. So, Discussing Nintendo, they had their first direct of the year, and it was Pokemon focused. And they announced uh, a few things on it. Uh, the first one was a surprise: the spin-off game Pokemon Mystery Team Rescue Team Mystery Dungeon Rescue Team DX is coming out March sixth, and they released a demo that's out there right now. And that's the one, like I guess, 2019 game that I've played was the demos like about an hour and a half uh they're about she could probably finish it a l- like you know a little bit less than that but it gives you a good idea of the game it's a dungeon game it's etrian odyssey it's the persona q games all that it's a roguelike so get ready for that but it has the pokemon spin on it with a cute art style and I, I just love that little world that they put them in. You know, you have to do a question test to figure out which Pokemon you are, and then you can pick your partner. And then I think one of the new things for this remake is that you can actually find Pokemon in dungeons and add them to your team, and you can have like a, a team of up to eight Pokemon. So you don't get to do that in the demo, but you do get to do some of the missions, you know, to kind of get a feel for that. And you get to explore the town, and it's kind of cute with all the Pokemon shops and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, and you have a Pelipper that comes and sends you mail, and I, I just I like the story in that game. I never playing the the DS game. I had it, and so I, I liked it back then. Of course, it doesn't have the sprites anymore now. They have model 3D models, and they look really cool. Uh, I appreciate how they do the the battling in that game. You can actually either just press a button and and do one attack, or you can have your fours attacks like you would in the regular Pokemon game, and you can actually learn new moves and all that kind of stuff, and you have to replace them just like the Pokemon game. So there's like a lot of Pokemon stuff in there that they added to a dungeon game. So uh, And I think if you think about them release, basically merging two games into one, and then also the maybe the graphics don't look completely updated from a DS that's 15 years old, but they look a lot better. And you know, maybe you could say, "Man, I wish this was 40 or 50," but I think you can certainly justify the 60 dollar price when you're talking about two games being merged into one. And there's a lot of stuff in there, a lot of side missions. Uh, so many, po- there's a lot of Pokemon, lots of things to explore, so it's a pretty hefty game, I feel like. The bigger thing, which also has people's ire, is the Pokemon Sword and Shield Expansion Pass, which has two sets of DLC. The Isle of Armor comes out in June, and the Crown Tundra comes out in the fall 2020. Uh, there's one for sword and one for shield, depending on the one, the version that you have, or if you have both versions. So it costs thirty bucks each, which is the pretty much the normal price for an expansion pass. That's what the Xenoblade Two One costs when I paid for that. Uh, there's exclusive characters. Clara is a poison type trainer, and Avery is a psychic. And they even have stuff that you can get right now. So if like you bought it now, you pre-ordered it now, you can go catch a Galarian Slowpoke. Which is basically like a slowpoke with some yellow on him. And you can go meet the, one of those trainers, depending on your version, and find out a little bit about the story before the the first DLC releases. So, plus, you're getting 200 new Pokemon, 100 for each 
piece of DLC for free. So people that complained about the national decks not having enough Pokemon, whatever, 200 of those Pokemon are now back in the game, and you're not paying for those. You can uh, get them by just trading them in from Pokemon Home or Pokemon Bank, which releases in uh, February. And, yeah, I mean, they're not charging you for that. So I don't know what people's complaints are about, oh, well, they are piecemealing the decks and they're charging us now for the decks. And I like it when I have to have another game that I pay full price for and I have to start my save all over again and I have to go through the same game for a third time if I bought the other two versions. Like, really? You want to go through that? Have at it. Most people don't want to do that. I'm glad that my save counts for something. And I'm only paying 30 bucks for it. So, I'm totally happy with this. I'm so glad that they have updated Pokemon to the modern era with an expansion pass. And both of these look kind of cool. I'm glad that... Each one of these has, like, legendary Pokemon in them. Each one of them has extra clothes you can wear, battle challenges, legendary Pokemon you can get, like, uh, different Pokemon that you get just for playing those games. Uh, So, I mean, in those Galarian, legendary birds look freaking awesome, uh, by the way, too. So, uh, I I don't really see what the complaints are. These are well worth their price that they're giving. And they look awesome, and I'm glad uh, Game Freak is doing this. So, I know you don't care so much, but... Well, I mean, it's just not surprising. Like, of course, there's going to have DLC. I mean... Do you think that they still announce a third game, possibly? Or do you think this means that they're not doing it? No, I think I think it'll be... I don't think it'll be a third game, because that's what this is for. Or, you know... Yeah. They don't have to, they don't have to make it, or, you know advertise this but here's here's more stuff (laughs) enjoy yeah there's a lot of people that are very skeptical and being like oh well they'll just announce another whole game too just to get 120 dollars out of us or yeah 100 you know 150 dollars out of us was like well like i mean hell like smash brothers had a season pass i mean uh splatoon yeah I was going to say, even, like, Luigi's Mansion has a season pass. It's cheaper, but it's like, why Why does that team need one? And it's like, well, we're selling costumes and uh, other multiplayer crap. It's like, mm-hmm. who's, who's asking for this? <laughs> well, I guess there's got to be enough people playing the multiplayer for them to do it. I mean, I don't know Maybe. anybody that is, but... Yeah. <laughs> you know, perhaps that that's happening. Uh, and the next thing here is that Resident Evil 3, it's been confirmed, won't have multiple endings like the original does. So I don't know if you... I don't even remember that, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine it was like just based on like who survived, maybe, or... Yeah, perhaps. Or maybe, like, it's, it's probably also based on like how how quick you finished it, because it used to have all that crap in there. Uh, Carlos is going to have his own section to play through, so his character is being expanded. And the biggest thing is that Nemesis will not be like the Tyrant. He will go all around Raccoon City, and he might show up at any point. There is no direct certain locations that he appears, and certain locations he doesn't. He could show up at any moment and terrorize you throughout the entire game. So that is being expanded upon from what they did in Resident Evil 2. Yeah, Resident Evil 2 had certain safe rooms you could basically, like, hide out in, and he would, like, it was like a boundary, essentially, like, that would prevent him from going in there. (laughs) Yeah, uh, I mean, do you like this idea of, like, making Nemesis more open? Well, sure, I mean, as long as, like, the actual city's more open, too. Like, my big problem with Resident Evil 3, even at the time, back in the day, was, like, the city was just, like, littered in crap. Or, like, you know, every... There'd be, like, on a city block, there'd be, like, one building you could enter out of, like, 20. Because, they were, you know, they just didn't have the resources to have interiors for all of them. So it's like, yeah, of course. But if the city is, like, a lot more open, even, like, more akin to, like, a Silent Hill, maybe, then sure. Yeah. I, I mean, it's good that when they make it more open for you so that there's more stuff available to play and I I like this idea of you know Tyrant was already pretty scary on his own so now you're 
doing this with Nemesis and and I think this adds a like un unknown element to the to the game that it's, you weren't necessarily expecting. It's funny because uh, I mean I'm I'm hopefully going to get the game on PC, but the PC version is already down to like forty five bucks. <laughs> well, like hey. to, like to like to pre order it in this like, huh? ah. That's not bad. <laughs> like, uh, definitely not. I'd go for that. Yeah. So, one of the things I'm excited about is the announcement of Kentucky Route Zero getting a TV edition, and it's completes for the people on PC, both on January 28th. It's coming to PS4, Xbox One, and Switch. I've been. I said I was going to wait until this whole series completed it's taken them years and years to complete it and yes finally it's going to be available this year at the end of january so sunday will be playing warcraft 3 reforged and i will be playing this so um and i'm going to be super excited about it so you know yeah uh i love it and i'm glad that you know pc is getting act 5 at the same time so everybody can kind of be enjoying that game at once and and talk about it because it's a pretty uh, fantastic game. Yeah, I have it on PC. I just couldn't get into it. Like I got like a pretty far in the first episode, and I was just like, "This is kind of boring me." <laughs> like, I, I why, like, why like, did it uh, bore you? Just well, I mean, it's it is kind of structured almost like a like Telltale game, or like you know, one of those types of adventure games. But like the graphics, you know, they're they're a little more retro. Or, you know, they're harkening back to, like, old, older adventure games. And I just kind of, like, I just felt like the plot was just kind of, like, very plodding along. And I'm like, yeah. I, I got, like, oh, let me see. Like, I got to, like, the mine in the first air, like, the first episode. And I was like, all right. I kind of see where this is going. Or, I mean, I don't, I don't know the plot, but I'm just like, yeah, I'm, I'm all right. <laughs> But it did look really nice. Like I'll give it that credit. Or it had you know a like, really good sense of style. Yeah, yeah I, I, this game has been on you know been in development for like you know six years or whatever. So yeah, like, twenty thirteen was the first one, and then it's taken them all these years to put the the different acts out. Yeah. So now they're going to have it all in one single package, and you can play this point and click game as you like. All right. And uh, Platinum Games, they got uh, they got an investor from Tencent, so why not? They might go into self-publishing uh, in the future, and they've you know basically had to use Nintendo or Square Enix or Sega to publish their games in the past. So now they might go into self-publishing and be able to make more money that way, which is good for them. And obviously Tencent. Once that, uh, Tencent obviously owns a ton of things at this point. You know, they have money in Activision Blizzard. They have money in Ubisoft. They have uh, big investments in... Uh, they basically own Riot Games, and they have part ownership in Epic as well. Uh, so they keep putting their fingers in various gaming pots, and this is another I mean- one. They even have a uh, movie division. <laughs> right. Because when I saw Bumblebee, it was like a 10 cent, but they, you know, they've done Venom and Wonder Woman and Top, you know, Top Gun 2 and all that crap. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it's, I guess it's nice that Vanc- or, uh, Platinum's getting money, but I just don't want them to own them outright. <laughs> even though, like, oh, we're going to remain independent and all that other stuff. It's like, yeah, for... We'll see how long this lasts. <laughs> right. Well, we'll definitely see how long that lasts. But I'm excited for Bayonetta 3 and Babylon's Fall looked pretty good when they showed it off at the Game Awards. So, you know, I, now, are you well, interested they, in either one? Now they can resurrect Scalebound. <laughs> yeah, I'm make... surprised Microsoft hasn't tried to do that yet. Well, it's funny, like... I think it was like that 2013 press conference that E3 is like, oh, we got we got all these games. We got Scalebound, we got Phantom Dust, you know, like one or two other games, and they all like crumpled or they all like basically fell apart. 
Yeah, uh, certainly. And then, or, you know, that whole lineup felt like it just didn't go anywhere. So, right. Uh, the, I guess, other thing, I forgot to put it on here, was uh, Vince Vincent Sempoella is now in charge of Dice LA, and he's going to try to resurrect that studio over there. I really hope that now that he has a lot more clout in EA that they leave him alone and he can do what he's done with Respawn and just absolutely remake that studio and, and they can make their own games and do something well there. And please don't use Frostbite. Yeah, that's the modern, modern uh, motto of people is please don't use Frostbite. <laughs> like, it's funny, I'm playing Star Wars Jedi and it's not perfect, but yeah, you can immediately tell the difference between that game and like a Frostbite game, you know, and Frostbite engine game. Yeah, it's like, that, that's not great. Like, <laughs> that's kind of scary when you actually think about it. <laughs> yeah. I but, mean, it, and how good it it does run, and I mean, that, that game itself is pretty great on its own, so it, it should show them that you don't need that engine. Yeah. But well, also, I feel like I'm hoping it shows them like you don't need to make like like huge multiplayer games anymore, or you know, like it, it's fine for some people, but other people like single player crap or you know smaller stuff. Exactly, as has like, been shown by Sony, who keeps doing that. Well, I mean, that's the big problem with all the Need for Speed games over this generation is they've all been like some weird online focused nonsense, mm-hmm. and I like, this this never has worked as well as any Forza Horizon game, or even, like, Test Drive Unlimited, like, on the 360. Like, that did it better than any, than ever Need for Speed game this generation. And it's like, at what point do you say, screw it, and stop doing that? <laughs> yeah, just try to provide a good story mode, have good racing, and there you go. You know. Bring back uh, Razor Callahan. I yeah, could do that, too. And, I mean, I'm not a Lord of the Rings person, but obviously it being one of the few announced PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X games, uh, I guess you got to talk about it. Uh, Daedalic Entertainment is making an action-adventure, like, narrative-based Lord of the Rings game uh, featuring Gollum. Basically, it's all about Gollum. And Everyone's they were talking... And do I say everyone's favorite character? Yeah, everybody's favorite character in in Lord of the Rings. And uh, you know they were talking to Edge magazine, and basically it's gonna be a different Gollum than the one you've seen in the movies, uh, because there is no size for him. He's not gonna look like Andy Serkis, so don't expect that. And it's gonna be more narrative based. Like it's obviously Smeagol and Gollum kind of challenging each other and fighting each other. Um, there's apparently going to be three or four conflicts per chapter uh, that you have to end up making a final decision on. Uh, you're not going to... Uh, I, it's supposed to make you basically pick sides. Pick sides between Smeagol and Gollum. And, you know, it's going to be so story-driven that you're going to be having to really make tough decisions between whether you pick one or the other. And they also mentioned that they have a three-game deal with uh, for Middle-Earth and that necessarily the next game may not be Gollum 2. They're going to try to do something else in that area. Which, personally, I would be much more interested in something else with that area. Uh, but, you know, I, I know Gollum also has his fans, I guess. So This sounds terrible. <laughs> yeah. Like, I guess I'm thinking about, like, well, first of all, like, Gollum itself, it's so ingrained with the films, you know, that that interpretation of the character, that, like, right, I, don't yeah. think can get, I don't think you can get away from it, honestly. It, like, even, like, the Mordor games had basically had that Gollum in, a, in him. The second... Yeah, exactly. That's, that's so true. Like, if you think about it, they could have gone a different way, right? And they didn't either because they know that it's pretty much the Gollum everybody knows. Yeah, and even those games, I mean, those games are supposed to take place like hundreds, if not thousands of years in the past. And 
you know, of Lord of the Rings, and it's still the same Gollum. Uh, yeah. The second, the second problem is, is I, I guess I'm thinking about Game of Thrones. So they had that one Telltale game, which was like very linked to the show. Like they, had, you know, they had some of the voice actors and stuff. Uh, or the they had some, but it voices. really could have not existed without the show. It could have existed without the show, right? Yeah. But I'm thinking about every other Game of Thrones game they've done has sucked. <laughs> Because they've like gone like wildly outside of the realm of the show, or like the established, mm-hmm. you know, narrative or the established, you know, basic culture. I of thought the that show. like PS3 game was like fine. Well, I'm thinking about they did they did this yeah. like uh, strategy game. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember that one. Yeah, yeah, that was just terrible. Uh, and it's like, yeah, that's that's not great. <laughs> I mean, granted, it was like Focus Home Interactive was publishing it, so it's like, yep, this makes total sense. <laughs> well, they Dalek is known for their story games. That's a lot of what they make. Yeah. So, I mean, if I'm going to trust a studio that isn't, you know, Telltale or isn't, uh, uh, what's the other one that's really known for that? Um, can't think of it. Or, you know, the Life of Strange People. Don't nod. Don't nod, yeah. So, they are are pretty decent. Like, I know Daniel reviewed one of their games for the site. Um, uh, Stephanie had another. I, I can't for the life of me think of the name of the the game Stephanie had. But yeah, it just that's that's what they do. So perhaps yeah. with it being a Lord of the Rings game, they can make it work. And there's a certain investment in that too. Uh, so because. Obviously, they have a three-game deal, but if this game doesn't do well, it's it's going to make you not really... Ca- Perhaps you're not going to be totally anticipating the next whatever, next Middle Earth game they make. So Yeah, I, I've reviewed two of their games, at least. I've reviewed, uh, I think, the Dark Eye, Chains of Satnav, and then some Black Guards 2 game. That was all right. <laughs> but they're also... The, the big, I think the big game they're really known for is their Deponia series. Yeah, Deponia is the the big, and that those all got ported to Switch. Yeah, now so you can you can play those but if I, you want. I, like I said, I just think like them doing like a very wildly different interpretation. Like, I mean, good luck because I think you, I think you'll need it because that, that's so ingrained just in the culture. Like I, I mean, I feel the same way about that stupid their that Amazon Lord of the Rings show. It's like, what? We already had the movies. They were good enough. We don't need more. <laughs> <laughs> but then I guess you could also say the same thing about Watchmen. That did really well. So what do I know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it did. Certainly. So I'm waiting for Watchmen Season 2 if they make it. Because the Watchmen comics went off the rails at a certain point. Because they introduced him to like the DC universe. So there's some DC comic, I think called Doomsday Clock. Where it's like... Yeah. Doctor Manhattan versus Superman, and I'm waiting for the show to go in that route, and that'll be great. <laughs> well, yeah, if you want to hear more about Doomsday Clock, you can listen on this uh, very network. Uh, source material covers Doomsday Clock. Uh, it came out like last week, so there you can uh, go hear more about that. <laughs> Certainly, because they reviewed Watchmen too uh, during this week, so the the HBO Watchmen, so. Yeah. They kind of had that come out together, and I think that's sort of it for news. Uh, looking at uh, games that are coming out, you got your your big ones that are coming out in January, basically. Uh, Dragon Ball Z Kakarot. That's your big new one coming out January seventeenth. Uh, waiting to hear back on that, and also waiting to be hear back on Token Mirage Sessions. Sharp FE, Sharp uh, Fire Emblem Encore. That also comes out the same day as Kakarot. And then you have some... Uh, you also have the Atelier uh, Dust Trilogy coming out as well on Tuesday. Those are based on the PS3 360 Atelier games. And uh, yeah, AO Tennis 2 just came out. So did the Monster Hunter World Iceborne that Mark is reviewing. Uh, Paperbound Brawlers. And then, of course, next week also there's the Wizardry 
Labyrinth of the Lost game, which the trailer looks pretty decent, and Hardcore Mecha, which is like a side-scrolling 2D Mecha game. So, I was going to yeah. ask, uh, have you seen uh, or Doctor Who yet? No, I have not watched it. I keep forgetting that that came back. I need to go and start I mean, watching them. It's a slight improvement. <laughs> slight improvement. How? What's the slight improvement? I mean, you couldn't. I guess you couldn't go any further down. Uh, oh, they okay. introduce a, they introduce a <laughs> character that's really good. I think, uh, but the first episode, it's like almost the first episode. It almost plays like an Austin Powers episode or like movie, like for like half the episode. I'm like, this is really silly. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? Why? Like, it involves a car, like a, a, a car that's like turns evil and is trying to kill him. Like you know, did the doctor and the companions? And I'm like, didn't they do this like in a few like a few seasons ago with uh, the Centaurans crap, like the Atmos cars? Like they turned evil. Um, I mean, that was like season or like series three, I think. You know, with David Tennant. But I'm like, yeah, I remember that. And then they introduce like MI, I think MI six, and it's like, oh, we have laser powered shoes and like rocket cufflinks, and I'm like, what? <laughs> like, is this is this Doctor Who or is this James Bond? Like, <laughs> well, they're trying to do several things, Scott. Yeah. Did yeah, you uh, see the Dice Awards also or Dice nominations? I saw them. I kind of check out. Of yeah, the so, award so, stuff once the year turns. So yeah, uh, you know ours are actually out there. I'll have a link in the description for our top twenty-five. So the the written staff version is is has been released. Uh, if you didn't listen to the top twenty-five podcast, it's Death Stranding. So and much to Mark's uh, chagrin, there. I, uh, I still claim final victory in the end. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I mean, anything uh, stand out to you about the I Dice mean, Award? No, it was just Control and Death Stranding got the most nominations. I mean, that's kind of that's kind of neat, I guess. I mean, I expect those are two of the most technical games, so I expected those two to get a lot of nominations. Uh, the, 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 I guess the interesting thing is uh, Call of Duty Modern Warfare got a lot of nominations. And it's like that. I mean, sure, I guess, but I don't. I don't remember a lot of people talking about that game necessarily, except for like multiplayer. Well, I think like the sound design apparently is well, like it, amazing, yeah. and uh, so that's another thing. You know, the graphics are always uh, a big deal. Yeah. As well for for those. Um, I mean, like their game of the year. List is Control, Death Stranding, Disco Elysium, Out of Wilds, and Untitled Goose Game. So, yeah, no fine with them there uh, for that because, one. Yeah, just because those uh, heathens haven't played it. <laughs> <laughs> Surprising, you would think that that would be more of a game that you know when you're talking about gaming people. Uh, oh, so they're, they're, yeah. The other funny thing was you see the Escape from Tarkov developers. Nonsense. What happened with that? They said uh, they they they're not, they're not going to put playable women in their game because because of lore and quote a huge amount of work is required. Really? No, it's not. Yeah. It's so you're going to tell me you're fine. not going to make a guy with with longer hair and you can't? Well, I mean just. Yeah. Like women are, I mean, generally speaking, women are more diminutive, diminutive than men. Like they're small, you know, smaller or thinner or whatever. But that's not a huge hurdle. Like, no, it's not. It's not a huge hurdle at all. They're making a big deal out of nothing. There's yeah, finding dumb reasons to why they can't put them in the game, and that doesn't make sense. So it's, oh, you lore, basically just say you don't want the- to, and that's it. You know? Yeah, the lore of the game says we can't put it. In. It's like yeah, everyone. Cares it's like about the lore, lore of the game for the people in what was it? A kingdom? What was that freaking medieval game that came out a few years ago? I got a kingdom deliverance. Yeah, kingdom come deliverance. Where they was like, oh, yeah, we can't have African American people. 
yeah, in all, our game. It's yeah, all that can. like weird Eastern like, Europe nonsense. I think yeah, it's like, yeah, is that, even though it's from there, yes, you can. It's, the game doesn't have to be completely authentic to that time. Nobody's going to give two craps about that. Like, yeah, this really? Escape from Escape from Tarkov is a Russian developed game, so it's like, yeah, that, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That just again say that it's more of a you have a problem with that and be honest instead of trying to come up with some some BS about it. Yeah. Yeah, interesting that uh, Death Stranding is not included when you say an outstanding achievement in story. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There are a lot of people that say that you know Death Stranding story is amazing or whatever. Yeah, it's, yep. it's not included in there. Out of Worlds uh, is instead. Right. So, but uh, yeah, I think that's gonna do it uh, for us on this one. We yep. will be if you're listening to the Games of the Decade stuff, we'll be back on Monday where we are actually going to try to get to 100 and perhaps uh, go deeper and actually break through the 100 barrier and, and start ranking that and getting to like the 80s or something and slowly make our way through that until we get to next week where we do a regular show again and perhaps we're talking about one of, if not both, those big games that are coming out. Yeah. Uh, in the middle of January here. So until then, thank you uh, for listening again, subscribe wherever you listen to us at. So you can get us at any time. Yeah. When we do release uh, a games of the decade thing, it's there along with our regular episodes and, and any other kind of feature thing that we do, go check out the website, w2net.com. The link to the top 25 is in the description and yeah, uh, good. follow us on Twitter at Debbie Tim Sean, at Humanity Plague for Mark, and we'll see you later, everybody. Later.